The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the class. Uh, before we begin, can I see by a show of hands if you can see my slides and you can hear me, if the audio is going through. Thank you, Vitaly. Thank you, it's all. Uh, looks like we're all to go. Albert, Tanan, Arun, thank you very much, guys. Uh, so let's get started. Um, my name is Mikhail. I will be your instructor for this half a day class. It will take us about uh, two hours uh, to cover the um, very fascinating topic, machine learning with Apache Spark. Uh, we will be um, pretty much uh, me talking. Uh, there'll be no labs. Uh, this is sort of a demo of the class that we are currently offering to our clients. Um, the logistics of the class will be very straightforward. Um, so it will be pretty much me talking, but I would like to make it as interactive as possible. Please, whenever you feel like asking a question, there is a questions pane uh, in your go to webinar console. Please um, uh, uh, put your question in there. Okay. Um, and I will attend to your question right away if I feel like it, or I will make a comment. Uh, I will read your question as well. Um, so I would like to make it uh, as useful to you as possible. Uh, definitely we are not going to cover any topics um, in any depth, uh, but at least uh, it will be engaging. Maybe you will see some things that you have been looking for some time uh, to, uh, to challenge yourself. Okay, so that's it. Uh, a little bit about uh, WebAge, uh, which I represent here. Uh, we are a training and consulting company based in Toronto. We are providing a broad spectrum of uh, regular customized uh, training classes in a variety of topics. Um, a bit about myself. I've been in IT for more than 20 years, working with a variety of tools, technologies. Uh, I'm certified enterprise architect, uh, mostly Java. Uh, online banking into uh, uh, major at uh, two major uh, banks. Um, I've been in a startup company, so and uh, recently, about three to four years, my focus has changed to uh, big data, uh, data analytics, uh, data science, uh, machine learning. Okay, so. Um, I'm not going to do a round table. We've got about uh, 58 attendees. Um, I'm not going to unmute anyone because usually what happens, uh, there might be a problem with the background noise. Again, the best way to communicate with me to ask a question or maybe provide a comment, if you will, um, to put the, your question in the questions pane. It's a detachable thing. Hopefully, uh, you can find it uh, easily. Uh, I'm not going to follow the chat window. Uh, it's very, very chatty. I, I'm losing kind of a track of where things are uh, going. Okay, it looks like we've got uh, pretty much everyone who is supposed to be there. Okay, let's get started. So uh, our topic is uh, very broad um, in nature and very deep uh, in, in substance, um, uh, both machine learning and Apache Spark. But uh, they, I guess, play together very well, uh, um, come together very well. And uh, we will do um, kind of a review of some of the more important topics. Uh, quickly, introduction to Spark as such, not going into any depth. Uh, but if you feel like uh, certain concepts are not very clear, because they might hamper your understanding of uh, more profound concepts, let me know. Like, we're not talking about RDD, so let me know what it is. Uh, ask me a question, I'll, I'll try to explain. Uh, Spark application architecture, lots of things uh, really underpin uh, uh, machine learning. Uh, Spark as a platform offers machine learning as a package, and in order to be uh, efficient and productive, you need to, bear, to be aware of the underlying mechanics of things. Uh, otherwise, you might find yourself in a situation where essentially you, you've got uh, a very shiny, beautiful algorithm which just doesn't work. Very frustrating, but uh, it takes just a little bit of um, affinity with the hardware and the infrastructure to understand what knobs you can kind of turn uh, to. 
uh, make your work, uh, make your uh, application working. Okay. Uh, we'll talk about a number of concepts like uh, packages, uh, formats. Um, we'll talk about um, a number of things, which again are just artifacts which make up that uh, what we call machine learning. Uh, machine learning, if you expect us to, to discuss, I don't know, like machine-based vision, like uh, real-time translation from one language to another, providing captions or text, uh, uh, kind of a hey Google type of things. Uh, it's, we're not covering uh, TensorFlow, uh, all those kind of deep learning neural uh, based uh, framework. Uh, we are talking about classification, clusterization, and all those things that in most uh, verticals you find uh, suitable uh, cases. Uh, okay, uh, there will be some code snippets. I will do a walkthrough uh, to get you a feel of what it is. You might have engaged, some of you might have some experience and uh, are here just to, I don't know, see if uh, you have some gaps. Uh, it's more of an introduction, but at the same time, it might be gonna like more uh, kind of a holistic representation of certain topics. Now we will talk about the differences between two uh, main packages currently used by Spark uh, Machine Learning. It's uh, MLib and ML. It looks like there is uh, uh, certain things are happening in this area, so you need to be aware. So let's get started. Um, uh, we will probably take a short break uh, at the top of the hour because me talking all the time would be quite um, cumbersome for you so that you can attend to maybe more important uh, matters. Uh, so uh, Spark Machine Learning, uh, we'll talk about uh, a number of things. Uh, it's just, um, I guess, one chapter which uh, contains material from a number of uh, topics. It's just a uh, kind of a, the aggregate of uh, some of the more important materials from different modules. But logically, they uh, just lead you to the point where you become aware of what is available uh, with Spark and um, um, how you can get started. Um, so the Spark platform, um, by the way, don't get it confused if you are very new to this. Uh, there is also a Spark uh, project uh, in Java. Uh, it's, it's not Apache project. Uh, and it's about uh, creating microservices and providing API. Uh, it's about uh, the uh, parallel processing uh, platform for processing massive uh, amount of data on a cluster of machines. Uh, so Spark. Uh, uh, is a platform which has uh, distinct uh, capabilities, uh, Spark SQL, streaming, machine learning, and GraphX. What's interesting in the design of Apache Spark is that all those things, they work together in concert. So, uh, for example, if uh, you have a socket server accepting requests uh, through that Spark streaming library, you can attach machine learning uh, algorithms with very minimal changes uh, from the static one and to process data in real time. So those packets, those um, uh, IP packets that would be flowing through the system would be coalesced into discretized uh, uh, RDDs, uh, resilient data sets, and uh, the existing algorithms could be applied because everything is RDD based, it's driven by the data, uh, API is uh, attached to um, the, that RDD object or data frame more specifically. And you can do very interesting stuff like a fraud analysis, uh, cross-sailing, uh, whatever your problem domain might be, right? All those things uh, for the most part work in memory, uh, which gives you a big uh, leg up of uh, existing frameworks, particularly those based on MapReduce. I, I don't think that we have a discussion of what uh, MapReduce is and how MapReduce uh, kind of fares against, um, matches up against Spark. But uh, in some, I guess, context, I will mention this. Uh, by the way, uh, one of the questions that people ask right away, uh, what do I need to do to, to get started? Um, uh, the most straightforward way is to download Spark. It's a, it's a Apache product, uh, project. Uh, it's part of the Apache Software Foundation driven by that license. 
uh, Apache license. Um, but uh, it, it's probably not uh, the whole and the best uh, uh, application of Spark. Uh, you are better off to use Spark as part of Hadoop-centric ecosystem. So how you would do this? Do you need to integrate it? Or do you do uh, do you need to go through all those hoops to configure your system to make it uh, uh, part and parcel of the thing? Um, things have improved uh, in a substantive way. Uh, currently, Hadoop is distributed by uh, three major players: it's Mapar, uh, Cloudera distribution of Hadoop and Hortonworks that, uh, Hadoop platform. So HDP, MAPAR, and CDH, they have Spark bundled already. It's not the latest, greatest, like version 2.0, I don't know, 2 or 6, whatever the version is now. It's probably version 1.6 before that uh, change in the, some of the parts of the uh, Spark context. But it's, uh, the beauty of this approach is that it already works together with Hadoop alongside with a bunch of big hive, all that uh, uh, f f uh, ecosystem of products. It has nice integration with HDF, uh, uh, HDFS, uh, the um, uh, Hadoop file system. Uh, it understands uh, how to talk to the resource manager, to Yarn, and that's the solution. So if you want to get started right away, um, I would suggest to go to Cloudera, CDH, uh, or Hortonworks. And they've got kind of a quick start or sandbox environment. It's a virtual machine that you can download, install on your laptop. As long as you've got bias uh, enabled support for virtualization, uh, you should have at least 8 gig of RAM for that thing. It's a big, a big animal. Um, and uh, then you would be able to uh, you get access to the shell uh, to submit tool with all the infrastructure, and you would be able to run uh, Spark and use whatever we are going to discuss here. Okay, so that's the way for you to start. Uh, Spark shell is your primary uh, tool. Um, there is a question. Um, uh, so it's a comment. Uh, for folks totally new to Apache big data machine learning, is there is a a pri uh, preliminary webinar course we should consider enrolling into. What the expectations require prerequisites from the participant of this webinar? Um, I believe uh, whoever has sent you the link, uh, probably you, we've got an account uh, manager or someone from your contact. Uh, uh, that communication should have arrived uh, to your inbox from someone. So that was the person to contact. Uh, definitely uh, the assumptions are that you are familiar with um, the fundamental things such as uh, what big data is, what machine learning is, uh, what Hadoop Hadoop is at least at the level where you can say, okay, I'm, I have heard this term. It's not going to kind of kill me to assume that I can get by. Uh, I, I'm not going to go very much deep into every topic. Uh, I don't have time. But what I would suggest, uh, if uh, you feel like you can benefit from this webinar, because I, I guess I already showed you the outline. Uh, I guess the description was provided to you with a link as well. If you're not comfortable, uh, feel free to hop off. Uh, there is no, I guess, um, uh, name taking. Um, uh, it's just a free webinar. But at the same time, uh, if you feel like uh, uh, hanging on, uh, and you would like to, make, to clarify certain things, like what RDD is, uh, just flip me a, a question, uh, I will answer it. As long as it would be, I don't know, in a matter of maybe one, two sentences. If more than that, uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to afford it. So, good question, but I don't know how, um, I don't know, to, to answer it. But anyways, I, I'll try to uh, kind of scratch the surface a little bit uh, wider so that um, at least I, I, I create a context in which we're discussing. So what we're discussing here, again, um, uh, we are discussing uh, the uh, machine learning uh, as it is capability, as it is provided by uh, Apache Spark, which is open source product. You can download, use it, no strings attached. Uh, the best way I explain what you need to do. Um, we're talking about big data uh, in terms of the size. Uh, we also talk about data that might be uh, coming in real time, uh, like Spark uh, uh, streaming is a way to, in, to, to uh, have a stream of data. It's not very robust, but it's not mission critical, but uh, in some cases it's uh, just uh, enough, a good solution. 
Uh, and we're talking about applying classification, classification algorithms for, of machine learning, or data science generally, uh, to your problem domain. Uh, there will be some examples of code which I will walk you through. Uh, you'll be uh, kind of comfortable in um, uh, at least following up. Um, I don't make any assumptions that you know Python, you, you know Scala. Uh, the examples, uh, as long as you have uh, some experience with programming, you will be fine. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that you at least have something. Like, like uh, when you learn a new thing, if it's you, you are new to this area, uh, the first thing that you need to, to be aware, don't, don't panic. Right, just uh, let the flow go. I, I, I'm here to help you as much as I can. And um, uh, the next step would be to use that maybe basic knowledge of what you have heard, uh, learned in this class uh, to take it to the next step. Okay, so it will be like small step towards your kind of a goal, your target uh, that you have uh, for yourself. Okay, Spark Shell. Uh, it's a REPL. Uh, REPL uh, it's a read eval print loop. Uh, so whenever you fire off, um, like, uh, you can use Scala, you can use Python. They've got their own REPL. It's a way to interactively communicate uh, um, with um, with the runtime. Uh, Java, I believe, Java 9 uh, finally got its own REPL, um, and uh, eventually it will make its way to uh, Spark. Spark reuses those uh, interactive uh, environments. Um, uh, it just provides like big uh, banner that it's Spark, but in fact it's a real uh, Python and Spark uh, uh, um, uh, Scala shell. Um, so you just type in the command uh, PySpark or Spark shell. I'm not going to give you a demo, uh, and after that you have a prompt. Uh, so at prompt you can start building your machine learning algorithms uh, implementation. Uh, the very First thing that happens is that uh, Spark Shell gives you Spark context. Spark context is this kind of a big uh, a, a facade type of thing. Uh, it's, it's it's just a facade type of API, which has um, lots of uh, methods properties, which allow you to uh, interact with the underlying infrastructure. Okay. Uh, currently, some people uh, are trying to experiment with R. R is not there. Uh, for R, uh, you are better off to use R as a standalone um, uh, tool for statistics, machine learning, data science. Uh, R, uh, you can get by with R on uh, Spark standalone, but not very much. R on those uh, Hadoop-based systems that I mentioned, uh, Cloudera, Hortonworks, MapR, R is not there yet. Binary is there, but doesn't work. Okay, so. That's it. Uh, when you start uh, Spark, uh, Spark context object would be created, and Spark context object points to that cluster of uh, uh, machines. To resource manager, it would know how to talk to the infrastructure. Uh, the Spark submit tool uh, is another tool uh, that you will be using. Uh, it's the actual tool for submitting your application. Spark shell. Um, underneath would invoke Spark Submit to do the job, but uh, it kind of hides that uh, interactivity at a uh, high level. But Spark Submit uh, is a tool, it's a script that allows you to submit uh, your job, whether it's um, Java slash Scala, JAR file. Uh, so JAR file is a Java archive, uh, Scala is Java-based language. Um, Java uh, is extremely fast, particularly when it runs over a period of time, just in time. A compiler would kick in after like 10, 20,000 of observations of a particular piece of code, and then it will compile it into native code. So that makes it really a very fast uh, uh, garbage collection is extremely good. Um, you need to configure. Uh, your jar file would contain your executable code. It would have the main methods, so to, so to speak, and that would be your driver program. So Spark has this notion of a driver program which uh, essentially uh, contains that main thread of execution, that entry point to the system. Uh, so Scala and Java gets compiled into Java bytecode to be executed on a JVM, Java Virtual Machine, and those jar files would be distributed on a cluster of machines. So that data locality where the data resides would be observed, the jar file would be sent to that machine where the, the data reside, resides. Uh, potentially you have lots of pieces of the data uh, spread across a cluster of machines, so uh, the system would distribute your piece of, your unit of work, that jar file, 
to all and every machine, so that every machine would see that piece of data, that partition of RDD, that resilient data set, and it will be processing uh, data in isolation from others. And there will be kind of a big um, kind of a master uh, coordinating, orchestrating the work, making sure that everything eventually would come to the finish line, it will aggregate the data, pull it back to the driver, and you will be presented with your uh, solution, okay? So the JAR file is important, but it's only for Spark. Uh, kind of a Spark uh, uses Scala, Java, and Python. Uh, another option is to use Python, many people are familiar with Python, uh, but Python out of the box is very nice toy language, uh, which is good for scripting, good for maybe learning uh, programming. But when it comes to really heavy weighting, like uh, linear algebra um, and uh, um, kind of uh, data science algorithms, then it needs to borrow from other libraries, like for example, NumPy. So NumPy is needed uh, to, which it's, uh, it's essentially bypasses, it introduces a C-based um, uh, the, the type uh, uh, structure, uh, uh, structure objects, which are very efficient. Like memory allocation is very efficient uh, because Python's uh, data type is kind of a fluffy. It's kind of an object, it's good, but not efficient. But Python gives you a very short development cycle. So right away you see, probably where I'm getting that. It's a dichotomy, which language should I use? Uh, for data science, you would be probably better off if you have not very extensive, like CPU extensive, very uh, lengthy, sophisticated um, algorithms, probably Python would be your first choice. Okay, uh, Python gives you a much shorter uh, dev uh, development cycle. You can set up and tear down your uh, models, your uh, your applications uh, in a matter of seconds. With Java and Scala, you would need to compile. Of course, you can set a Maven repository, you can set a class path, but still you would be losing some of that uh, agile uh, aspects of what you can achieve with Python. Uh, Python needs to be installed on every machine, and it, it is. Uh, usually all machines come with Python. Uh, it should be the same version of Python, one thing. The second thing is that you need to augment uh, the repository of local uh, Python installation with uh, NumPy and uh, some additional packages like Pandas, uh, whatever uh, you're going to use, right? So if you don't have it, uh, you'll have a runtime exception on a particular node. So you need to have some sort of a um, cluster management tool like Kubernetes, uh, whatever DevOps operations practices you have. Uh, so Spark Submit uh, is your primary tool. Um, and uh, whenever you're satisfied with REPL, uh, you see that code seems to be working and you have already done prototyping, it would be a matter of just packaging that code and bundle it either, either as a JAR file, if it's a Scala in Java, or as a Python code. Uh, Python gets distributed at source level. There is no need for compilation. Um, um, Spark submit is important uh, because that's where, I guess, you will probably need to ensure that you don't get out of memory exception. One of the such options is that executor memory. Executor is that process which would be running your machine learning algorithm. So someone might ask you, might ask me, so why are we talking about those things? So where's the machine learning? Where's that, I don't know, k-means or whatever the case might be? We're going to talk about this shortly. But if you don't do this uh, kind of a baselining, uh, that, that uh, proper understanding uh, what you need to do, then you uh, have very frustrating experience. And I don't blame uh, Spark. Uh, you should blame uh, maybe just uh, lack of RAM that you have and the amount of heap allocated uh, for execute. Execute is runtime. You have a, a configuration parameter, execute a memory. That is a parameter for you to, to tweak. Like in our case, at the very bottom uh, bullet, we configure it to be 32 gig. Of course, your machine should uh, provide enough memory on top of that. It should be probably 36, uh, so that the system processes uh, are not starved by you allocating that much. Um, Spark is extremely a versatile tool. It understands a number of uh, resource management uh, systems. Um, in addition to its local Spark native cluster management tool, it understands uh, methods, it understands yarn, it knows how to talk to, to other uh, systems. Here's an example, uh, like uh, third bullet from the 
bottom uh, how to submit um, uh, a Java on Spark jar file. So we specify that it should be a local master, uh, uh, native cluster management tool, port. Uh, and optionally, you can specify how many CPU cores um, you need to uh, specify. So in this case, a uh, system would consume all the um, uh, CPU cores, uh, like virtual uh, cores, uh, which might not be a good idea. So you need to specify maybe n equals to 2. And again, you need to understand how uh, your cluster works. Probably your machines have at least four cores, and you know that you will be probably a sole uh, kind of a owner of that cluster for that uh, duration of your of your task. So in this case, you can bump up. Um, uh, everything is done on the cluster of machines, so trying to kind of leverage that CPU cores might not be kind of a very rewarding activity. Maybe allocating and equals to two, allocating two threads for execution on every uh, node uh, would be sufficient. So that's an, one of those uh, 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 kind of black magic skills that um, you will need to, to learn. So there is more information. Uh, another parameter that is not shown here should be configuring the driver memory. So driver is the process where the big bang happens. So that's where you launch your product, uh, your application, and uh, that's where uh, things will start kind of uh, spinning up. But at the same time, uh, driver is the recipient of the results that uh, will be produced by the cluster. So eventually it will pull back, it will, col it will collect all the data back so that it will produce kind of a cohesive, uh, nice report. And if you don't have enough memory, and that a uh, large data set that arrives can really blow you out of, of the water. So you need also to configure uh, the driver memory uh, of that machine uh, from which you run your application uh, to, to be uh, the maximum possible value. Again, it should be in a matter of gigabytes. And that machine should really be powerful enough to do the job. Okay. Uh, there would be a diagram which shows the relationship between the driver, the executor, and everything. So, I have a question. Uh, can the master URL point to a Kubernetes cluster? I don't think so. No. Uh, unless there might be a third party which kind of do this. Uh, it's more about... Um, those methods uh, stand alone and the uh, yarn. So the question, whatever, um, yes. Um, you know what? Uh, let me try to un uh, unmute you, whatever. I, I'll, I'll see if I'll see what I can do. Give me a second. Slowly, I'm going down. Yeah, Oliver, go ahead. Okay, uh, it's fine. Actually, you've answered the question. It's just that I, I did. Okay, good. Sure okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, yes, I tried that. It looks like I can unmute. So, if you have a question and you would like to ask the question over um, over the mic, uh, let me know. As long as it's not a long winding question, and uh, okay, keep it short. But anyway, thank you for your participation. Looks like um, we've got interest. Uh, so another question is, uh, by the way, I, I'm the only one who handles this, so I don't have someone, an assistant, who would uh, sieve through all the questions, so I'll keep my eye open. I know that kind of a bifocal where I can keep uh, kind of a, my eyes on both uh, my screen and the questions, but what's the difference between Spark 1 and Spark 2? Uh, the main difference is the way they instantiate uh, your application, like the way to create Spark context. That's the major one. Um, and eventually, certain things that have been proclaimed, uh, like data frame for uh, uh, Spark SQL in 1.3, uh, eventually it made its uh, kind of a final way. It was accepted as the primary. Some additions to uh, machine learning algorithms, and a bigger deviation from that MLib, the old one, which we're going to talk about. Okay, it's moving towards ML, which is a uh, data frame based uh, system. Uh, not big difference, but uh, in some cases, I guess, uh, you won't be able to run your existing code. You would need to kind of tweak a couple of things, uh, change that instantiation um, code, and it will be fine. 
it's not a big uh, kind of a end of the world type of thing. It's uh, backward compatible for the most part. Um, so the execute and worker processes. I believe there is a yeah. Um, so your your job that you submit uh, through your Python program or through uh, Scala Java. Don't discard Java, uh, even though kind of Scala kind of uh, gives you a much more compact syntax. Uh, Java 8 with that Lambda uh, supports uh, also kind of uh, makes it uh, kind of a, a very applicable tool, particularly if you've got lots of talent um, experience with Java. But Scala gives you this kind of a map reduce filter type of API, which is, um, I would say, very native uh, to functional programming API to handle the data, right? So maybe it'll be a good uh, chance for you to learn Scala as well. Uh, you don't need Scala in its entirety. Like Scala is notoriously uh, difficult to learn, particularly advanced topics. But for the most part, you get by by just learning certain idioms that you can use Scala like uh, uh, like uh, those um, uh, class objects, um, kind of a template objects um, using, uh, um, I guess, those functional programming, high order functions, uh, so not a big deal at all. Okay, Spark uh, job consists of multiple tasks, and every task might be kind of a map, reduce any sort of a transformation that uh, is needed. And the output of a previous transformation would be fed as, uh, uh, input to another task uh, to be processed down the road. And job would continue until uh, there is some sort of a kind of end point, uh, like uh, an action being executed. Uh, so the executed processes are essentially containers when you run on, on Yarn. Uh, Yarn will allocate uh, for every JVM enough RAM and virtual uh, CPUs, which is a container. Executor have uh, built-in cache, that's where Spark achieve efficiencies. You have API to access that cache. Uh, this is particularly uh, relevant to machine learning algorithms because caching in many cases can speed up your processing, right? And um, so you've got that uh, worker node daemon running on every machine and that executor process as a runtime would be uh, uh, launched by the daemon on command from the master. Okay, so essentially you've got Spark, driver program, and executor processes, and this is a picture. So let me just quickly highlight a couple of things uh, for you. Again, uh, I don't want to preach to the converted. If you know what I'm talking about, uh, I need to do that. So that's where the big band starts. I display it in green, kind of a peaceful color, color but essentially that should be kind of red. Right, so we, that's the guy who actually is responsible for launching. That's a happy guy, right? So this guy kind of launches the script. Uh, the driver program uh, would need to create Spark context. So that's the difference between uh, REPL, uh, uh, your application, and between one, one asterisk uh, and version two of Scala, uh, Spark. So uh, your driver program needs to know how to connect you need to configure that uh, to how to connect to the cluster management. It can be Spark standalone Yarn methods. So that's the cluster already, right? Your machine can be sitting somewhere outside. And the cluster manager knows how to talk to, uh, uh, to the cluster of machines. Uh, every machine would contain a bunch of hard drives. Uh, usually there are several disk controllers. Kind of uh, on Hadoop you'll have three, five, maybe 10. Uh, hard drives attached, and your data reside somewhere on um, that machine, right? So the system knows where those blocks of data are, those uh, segments or splits. You have a, a terabyte worth of data, and usually that block is 128 meg. So that kind of a, a big a big file gets split into uh, chunks. Uh, every chunk is replicated, uh, but uh, for us, we know that uh, the system is aware of IP address and the block ID that would make up eventually the name of uh, the, the, the physical representation of the file. 
to execute this runtime work a node uh, it's uh, represented by daemon which is listening for for the instructions from the master and the executor would launch your job uh, essentially job which would be split across uh, worker nodes and every task would constitute essentially it would be the same probably task but running on a different machine doing some sort of ETL script or maybe mapping or filtering but it would happen on that particular block segment of data which uh, the machine is uh, seeing so that machine would be only seeing what's available on on the uh, store attached to that machine right so that's where the split happens that's where I guess spark uh, can really uh, apply those uh, machine learning algorithms on the cluster of machines because essentially every uh, executor would be crunching their own piece of work uh, but together jointly they will produce the result that you need so whether it's uh, classification clusterization um, whatever that can maybe some statistical thing uh, trying to find some descriptive um, uh, statistics uh, standard deviation maybe average value okay so that's how it works it starts here um, yes one thing that I wanted to mention as well I did it in passing uh, but again it's worth it's uh, iterating um, so whenever you submit the job, so your job, your jar file, or your Python code would be eventually distributed on every machine. Okay, you might have another machine which has some data pieces, and that guy would go there. It's kind of a client-server in reverse mode. You don't download data; you upload your execution mode, your execution uh, task, which will get executed in the executor memory. But when you're done, you would need to collect the data. So the data, that would be phase one, data is processed internally, that's step two. And then the final step, I'm kind of trying to show that sequence diagram. You'll get back the results. So the results <clears throat> will represent uh, some uh, output of, uh, if you, unless you persist the data locally, so it's possible to persist the results here right away on the same machine where the processing was done. But in some cases, you might want to pro proceed with uh, some uh, additional processing. So for that, you would require downloading data. When you download the data, uh, you collect the data, you need to make sure that you, you have the driver um, uh, process um, uh, heap uh, set up to the level where you would uh, be able to absorb that spike okay so the question is uh, as spark is memory intensive what is the impact of spark applications which run along with other yarn uh, apps yeah when you own yarn essentially those jobs would be enqueued in the same way as if it was another um, another Hadoop centric so it's not going to jump the line it would be playing in line with what is available Right, so the machine, uh, the resource manager would be allocating, um, it would be checking um, the less loaded um, uh, nodes. So uh, like on Hadoop, uh, you've got three replicas at least, uh, that's the usual uh, rule of thumb. And the machine, uh, which would be targeted for execution would be allocated based on the load factor. So we're not talking about this uh, in queuing, but uh, as long as you, uh, uh, you are on Hadoop um, and you connect into resource manager you are playing by those rules when in Rome do as the Romans do um, in addition to interfaces with multiple um, resource managers um, spark also gives you uh, an excellent integration with a variety of uh, distributed uh, storage systems uh, HDFS we mentioned that but in addition to that there is a way to integrate spark with uh, Amazon simple s uh, storage service Swift from OpenStack spark knows how to decipher and read uh, Cassandra HBase and other like uh, sequence file of Hadoop it understands Avro it understands uh, uh, Parquet <clears throat> so spark is good in this regard it's kind of a polyglot type of thing okay uh, there is a number of ways to run spark I wish I'm not going to talk about this um, 
it's kind of confusing. But anyways, you can run Spark in a number of uh, scenarios. Okay, um, Google Cloud Platform, um, why not? Why, why you can, I guess, deploy it, and maybe there is uh, some sort of uh, Docker containers that you can deploy, which would contain Spark. Um, but you are better off, uh, again, uh, the point I want to make uh, that Spark, I guess, like logically was designed such that it would uh, take advantage of the deficiencies of MapReduce. MapReduce, excellent tool, but it's slow, right? And, and in many cases, particularly when it comes to very responsive machine learning uh, type of uh, development cycles, they uh, early in the game recognized the the need for something which would work uh, and kind of take will uh, take the place of MapReduce. So for that reason, um, Spark is good on Hadoop, as opposed to Spark being kind of a good at standalone, maybe running somewhere in the cloud. So it, it kind of works by association. So Spark really shines when it comes uh, bundled uh, with Hadoop. Okay. Maybe not Hadoop, maybe other systems like Mesos, but uh, in itself, uh, it's its own uh, kind of standalone uh, cluster management tool. Is it's just, um, I guess, uh, um, just for demo, I would say. So machine learning uh, gives you um, high quality uh, uh, support for uh, select machine learning algorithms uh, of high quality. And the beauty of that implementation is that they run on a cluster of machines. So you can run, I don't know, scikit-learn on your local machine. You can un, run R, uh, whatever the case might be. Essentially, uh, machine learning uh, took the place of uh, Mahout, which used to be all the rage like several years ago before Spark really took that position. So you can build uh, processing workflows, which is the latest uh, version of machine learning. Uh, you can do dimensionality reduction, uh, feature extraction, uh, and um, lots of algorithms, very good, very uh, categorized uh, text uh, mining is supported as well, in addition to what I mentioned. Uh, and machine learning, uh, by virtue of Spark running a cluster of machines. They just leverage that uh, infrastructure, that functionality. Meaning that uh, you have a, a definitely a big advantage by being able to run those algorithms uh, running on a cluster of machines as opposed to a single machine. Of course, you, you cannot have, usually, uh, your data sets would be in a matter of several gigabytes at max. And you can run it safely on R on local machine, R supports 64-bit um, uh, architecture of CPUs, but uh, sometimes uh, you want to speed up your machine learning and uh, processing. So for that, uh, you can achieve uh, several times uh, multiple, uh, and also maybe two orders of magnitude faster processing. Okay. Spark supports Java, Python, and Scala. Uh, R is a good discussion, but R is not there. So, okay, we are talking about primarily between Scala and Python. Java has lost its uh, kind of attraction because of a little bit of verbosity, and Scala really, uh, in terms of API, uh, in terms of fluidness, and uh, the very concise nature of, uh, of the language really uh, is a preferred way to use. In this context, Java is going to stick for a long haul, but uh, you have a choice between Scala and Python, pretty much. And I would say, um, I kind of keep kind of telling this, that this current um, IT landscape is not about or. I am using, we are Java shop, or we are a uh, .NET shop, or we, we don't accept it, we are PHP shop, and we, we, do a, we are doing great. Essentially, it's about and. It's about inclusiveness. It's about saying, okay, guys, you need to do uh, you, need to, you have use cases that you can solve with this system, but at the same time, there is a bunch of use cases that are not suitable, like hammer nails type of thing, right? We need a screwdriver, we need pliers, we need um, a torch. Uh, we have a tool set. So you, I would suggest uh, Scala and Python, maybe Python and Scala for machine learning. Okay, there are some versions, if I'm not reading this uh, stuff. 
Okay, so there is another question. Uh, does MLIB um, come along with Spark binaries or is it a separate component on top of Spark? It's, it's a part and parcel. It's, uh, it makes up, uh, remember that first slide where you've got Spark uh, platform and there are four uh, kind of a Skype scrapers uh, sitting on that uh, kind of a ground zero. That's what it is. Essentially, it's fully integrated. You don't need to do anything else. Uh, two major packages of MLIP, uh, you've got spark.mlib and spark.ml. Uh, the original, the kind of a, uh, how they're positioning it, kind of a frozen, uh, kind of a uh, API is MLIP. Even though it's more it's, it, it has the broader support for algorithm compared to ML. ML is catching up, but ML has productivity uh, tools, it has, a number of advance, uh, advancements over the standard uh, MLIB uh, library because it introduces the concept of data frame. Data frame, uh, think about it as a relational uh, table of some sorts, which has uh, columns, uh, which has meta information which describes columns, uh, types, and you have a, a very good uh, way to build uh, processing pipelines, which are very important in machine learning. If you have a process that uh, requires you to partition your data between tests uh, and uh, training, uh, training data and uh, test data, uh, maybe feature extraction, uh, dimensionality reduction, you can build that pipeline once and you don't need to have separate kind of uh, applications working uh, together like uh, in, a, uh, in a Unix type of uh, piped operation where you pipe to build, build long uh, pipelines. Essentially, you, you build pipeline using the pipeline API. I guess there'll be an example how this is constructed. So ML is your preference, so start using ML. Don't go with MLIP, even though this slide, um, this presentation has slides with M, MLIP. Not a big difference in API. Sometimes it's just a matter of naming that uh, train uh, method and replace it with fit. So fit is more kind of popular with ML. Okay, so uh, the traditional uh, MLIB uh, package has um, the following supports uh, for, I guess, three big categories uh, for classification and regression. We've got pretty much uh, what you would expect uh, SVMs are supported, naive bias, um, decision trees, uh, it's actually ensemble for random forest, um, which makes all the sense, right? Uh, because now you, you have this ability to start from one executor process, not kind of a part of uh, the heap, but actually part of that cluster. Uh, clustering is supported, um, and we've got dimensionality reduction, we've got uh, singular uh, value decomposition on PCA. Okay, so that's what uh, they don't support. There is also text mining, uh, not shown here, but uh, it doesn't support things like you would expect that somehow it would ha has uh, some sort of a tensor flow like what Google does. It doesn't do this yet. Maybe they will decide eventually, but they are busy with what they currently have. So that's a new spark.ml uh, package, uh, which is uh, the new incarnation of uh, Spark MLib. They have some holes, uh, for example, dimensionality reductions that don't have um, uh, SVD. Uh, a little bit uh, kind of lean on clustering, but in most cases, uh, probably people are just converging to use uh, k-means for the most part, or maybe uh, JMM, the Gaussian uh, mixture model. Uh, classification regression works fine. Uh, all those things that you would expect, uh, random forest, uh, logistic uh, regression. Okay, Spark ML. Um, it has been added uh, since early in the game, but uh, it somehow didn't make its way and it didn't get enough traction. So people continued to use the existing one. And in most cases it was fine, but I guess that uh, pipeline processing, uh, which was a major influence uh, from uh, scikit-learn, where they have similar ideas, I guess uh, Spark developers are moving or forcing you to move to that uh, new 
and Brave world of uh, Spark.ml. Uh, they introduced a new concept data frame. I believe it was a major influence from R, uh, maybe uh, uh, from Pandas. And data frame uh, is extremely um, versatile uh, structure, which allows you to really um, build very interesting things. Pipeline is only possible through data frame. Uh, so what? Um, to understand how things are really tick, uh, you need to to understand how MLib uh, packages your uh, your input data. Uh, there is a concept of uh, dense and uh, sparse vector. Uh, dense vector is what we usually use. So all elements in a vector are present, uh, so we've got uh, everything. Potentially, we might have uh, not available data, not a number or we might have a zero, or maybe some sort of placeholder. If we've got uh, uh, sensor readings and we've got zero, that's, that might be an indication that somehow we didn't have voltage and that particular sensor didn't really send any signal within that time. Okay, so meaning that we need to skip it. Uh, sparse format gives you a little bit of a more uh, intelligent way of handling those missing data or outliers. Uh, this structure, just be aware, it's not, not, a, not a big deal altogether. So what we are doing here, uh, we essentially specify the length of uh, vectors that we expect. But uh, let's say we uh, want to treat that zero as data that we don't want to produce. Uh, so for that, we have the actual dense vector with the missing uh, values, elements there, and we also have that index uh, lookup table which contains the indices like 0, 1, 3. You see the, ind the index 2 is missing, which points to that zero, uh, 0 value. Okay, It gives you a little bit of a more compact way, but um, not very much. But at least this is something that would intel intelligently help uh, the system to process the data. Uh, label point, uh, it wraps up uh, and creates a structure for labeled or classified observation. Observation is kind of a record. It's uh, what we have captured in our um, observation of a particular phenomena. Uh, it's used in supervised learning for classification. Uh, and essentially, it contains values uh, for, for features. And it contains the label. So label is something that you arbitrarily decide what it should be, like 0, a particular class or category. 1 would be the next class like two, three, four, and what's not. It's a double value. Um, um, and I guess an example would uh, show what I mean. So we are using Python in this case. Uh, Python comes with that uh, label, uh, labeled point uh, object, um, which gives you for a dense vector representation a way to bundle that uh, feature vector which uh, shows uh, properties, va uh, values of every property, of every attribute or feature. Uh, its observation might be speed. Uh, this might be speed, that might be age, that might be income, that might be, I don't know, like uh, footage. And we have a label, which is zero. Okay, so we have just created a data point. And you've got like millions of observations for hundreds of classes. Essentially, you will be building gradually use that thing. So when you do this, everything is going to happen in your local memory. This is driver, right? So that's the driver uh, program, which would be essentially crunching that thing. And eventually, it would need the support of the cluster. Everything is going to be uh, kind of sent out uh, on the cluster. So sparse uh, vectors, uh, we've talked about this. So now we um, have. Label point is agnostic. Essentially, it just takes that constructor, which takes instead of a dense vector, a sparse vector. Uh, another very popular format is LibSVM. Um, support vector machines, I guess, were the influence for that. Uh, it's very similar to a labeled point that we just talked about, right? And in fact, uh, when you start uh, reading data in lib SVM format, eventually you will end up having those labeled points. Uh, it's sort of a, I would say, um, JSON, simplified JSON. You've got uh, 
uh, key value pairs, space separated, uh, that key or property is essentially the index of that feature that we talk about. A zero based uh, class label is what designates um, this particular class uh, so that we know a priori uh, ahead of the game that this observation that feature set that we are describing is in fact uh, belongs to this class. It will be used for training and um, it might be also used for, for testing. Uh, so that's how things are done. LibSVM uh, is another structure that you need to be aware of. There is API which supports this. Okay, quick example. Uh, loading as libsvm um, the nice thing is that uh, machine learning uh, by the way we will have a break uh, for about five minutes in uh, in five minutes so on the top of the hour it's 12 uh, noon uh, eastern standard time so we'll have a break uh, at that time uh, we just use uh, the utility uh, objects that expose that way to um, bring the data from local file system, from HDFS, from any of the supported file systems, right? So we read the data. Whenever you see SC, right, SC is Spark context. So that Spark context, it's at the pointer to the resource manager. It has all the configured properties. It knows the name of the application. It knows uh, kind of it, it's a context object, and it's used for that centerpiece. It's centerpiece for the API, okay? It's a naming convention, so use I see as well. Um, and we create a data set uh, where when we read that uh, um, LibSVM, every data set, it's a record set, which we are going to create, where every record, RDD, uh, think about it as uh, um, kind of a just a flat file, flat file with lots of records. And we have every record stored as label point. Okay, so label point is this guy. So that you can extract, so the algorithms actually, it's not going to be you. The algorithm would extract that uh, record going through the data set from top to bottom. And uh, it will start doing that classification uh, or any other uh, operations that's. Um, you want it to do. Um, by the way, uh, we use that uh, existing MLib uh, API and uh, a sample of Spark.ml, which is a new uh, API for handling machine learning uh, tasks. We'll give you something like this. We have Spark context, uh, read, uh, to read it's a read object, the results are right, and you specify the format, which is a nice way. It can be JSON, it can be CSV. It's kind of a more, it's kind of a more, more, more fluid. And we load the data, and we will have the same thing, but it will be, I believe, data frame. Okay, so what's the difference? Not, nothing much. We just uh, use that LibSVM. As long as you understand those concepts, you're at home. Uh, nothing is really going to frighten you. Uh, local matrices, again, one of those things that you just need to be aware. Uh, nothing really exciting, uh, but it's uh, one of those artifacts uh, that you need to be kind of punctu punctuation uh, 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 character. So if we've got a matrix, uh, that matrix can be, uh, I guess, flattened out by using that column-wise operation. Um, I believe if you can see that color, uh, the very first row has that uh, kind of a reddish color, kind of a carrot-like thing. And uh, when you flatten it out, it will be flattened like this, column-wise. We've got the first column, two elements, and the second column. Uh, what it's used for, it's used for um, uh, building matrices uh, in, in such a way. If you are familiar with uh, um, matrices in R or kind of pandas, that's the way to take uh, kind of an array of objects, a vector of objects, and uh, have that shape, uh, the target shape of the thing, of, uh, of that uh, structure data frame. So we have three rows, and we've got uh, two columns. So eventually, uh, we create a dense matrix. There is no gaps. 
which would contain three records as follows. We've got 1, 0, 2, 0, then 3, 0, 4, 0. Essentially, we are doing reverse operation. Again, so when you see that uh, CSC, uh, just go to the slide on page 32 and it will help you. Okay, so um, let's do a break for five minutes and we will continue after that with this slide. So a short break, five minutes.
continuing distributed matrices um, MLIP supports a number of um, different formats low matrix index row matrix uh, again they are specific for certain tasks um, I'm not going to go into much of uh, details uh, so the main idea is that we take um, matrices uh, and we split them in a way that would facilitate uh, distributed processing of matrices so we've got this parallelized method uh, spark which spark context uh, exposes and then we would collect the data so parallelized is essentially a way uh, to build splits of those matrices where that split would be sent to the worker node and the executor process would uh, receive that particular um, data the data is not attached in a hard drive to that machine uh, the opposite is now the case because we are sending that piece of the data to be sent to the cluster alongside with the processing unit with the compute unit so that's the API uh, for example if we want to process uh, matrices using the raw matrix type we do as follows um, we create two arrays which would become uh, feature vectors and we submitted uh, for parallelization as you see we've got SC the spark context and parallelize is a way to take this thing and split it on the cluster of machines but now on every um, node on every in every executor process we will have this type of operation happening so that raw matrix would take um, and create um, uh, that partition that split around uh, RDD or more specifically a partition of the RDD and then you would be able to apply like linear algebra and whatever is required for machine learning um, uh, classification and regression in the uh, traditional MLIB uh, package uh, as follows so we've got a number of problem types it's interesting how the position uh, you see we've got problem type um, binary classification multi-class and they fit in same kind of decision trees for different things so it's eventually be up to you to decide which algorithm is most suitable uh, regression um, all those algorithms are supported uh, meaning that essentially you just need to provide your data in that uh, libsvm or labeled uh, points uh, uh, formats and you will be able to uh, start data processing okay so uh, that's the first example uh, I'll do a walkthrough it would be nice to do a demo but demo is usually I don't know it doesn't help very much you cannot uh, highlight certain things so this is something uh, th this is um, um, uh, Python code uh, which uh, would be submitted using the submit uh, uh, spark dash submit tool so we create uh, spark context <clears throat> because we are not using REPL right uh, let me change the color it will be red so we create spark context and we give a name to the application and then whenever you see SC that's a way for us to integrate meaning that beyond this point something is going to happen something like fun is going to happen on the cluster it's that interface so mutils is a way to load the data um, so what we do we're using the random forest algorithm which is essentially uh, um, an ensemble of decision trees you can specify the number of uh, trees that uh, you want to use but we need to use the training data usually you just do the training right the testing happens at a later time but we do it in just one go uh, it's just uh, one uh, you know, short of at um, your data 
we expect uh, two classes, right? Uh, we expect two labels, uh, and we specify five trees. So we will use uh, the number of trees would be an odd number, so we are using uh, five here. Um, Fisher subset strategy: how to break. Um, so decision, a decision tree is about uh, decision points where a certain rules would be applied to uh, process data from uh, uh, kind of a big blob all, all the down to the leaf, where the leaf would uh, represent that fully classified, fully identified object. So it can be entropy, uh, Shannon uh, entropy, it could be variance. Um, uh, essentially, we just reducing with every uh, decision point, uh, that strategy would help us to reduce the amount of entropy. Uh, the amount of uncertainty about the data. So we are becoming more and more certain towards that going through branches in that leaf, in that tree to the leaf, where leaf would be a final destination, saying yes, with a certain degree of certainty, we can say that this particular object belongs to uh, class zero or class one. Um, so we do a training, uh, random forest is an object, uh, import is not shown, it might be shown in your um, labor, uh, your uh, lecture books. Uh, we do, we train, we try to fit the model, we take the training data, right, from this point. We specify a number of classes, two, categorical feature info, it would be uh, in out, uh, dictionary, we've got five and auto. <clears throat> so now, essentially, the model that we create after a period of time, that would be a lengthy process. You might be stuck. And by the way, uh, when your training is important and it's, it's a, a recurring factor, you're going to train data over and over and over again, Python might not be a good choice. You might, it might drag you down. So in this case, probably switching to Scala would help you to improve things. But with, as with every decision tree algorithm, when you're done with the model, the model is extremely fast. Um, for, for, for all it matters, is just, it contains just uh, uh, if-else type of, uh, you can serialize and you can view what that model is made up. It will be just if-else type of um, uh, conditional operation. So if a particular feature is below a particular threshold, then, make, uh, uh, it would be the rules that uh, the algorithm would follow during the prediction. So we've so far have done training and now we need to do prediction. Uh, that's the whole kind of a holy grail of what we've done so far. We need to find a way to say that this particular data point uh, belongs to whatever class. We've got two classes, it will be kind of a binary classification. So we use model as the, uh, our primary object now. By the way, the good stuff with machine learning that, is that you can serialize it. You can serialize model somewhere in a file system. You can send it as an attachment to FTP it, and then execute prediction on another machine, which is a kind of a very powerful concept. So model is serializable. Uh, and now you can do predict, uh, and we take the test data. So we do text data and we plug it in. Um, so test data is stored in the format which allows us to do the map. Uh, so map essentially it's apply a particular function like feature selection to uh, uh, so it's lambda uh, lambda anonymous function. Again, I'm not going to spend much time, uh, so just use the slide uh, for your reference. Uh, and uh, then it's just something that I guess uh, you can combine. Uh, it's not part of machine learning; it's just part of Python. We have predicted labels, and we've got uh, the actual, um, we want to have predictions uh, bound with the actual, uh, um, we pull out, because test data um, would have a label, now we want to compare. We build that, uh, what's called the confusion matrix. So we do zip, we just bind them, kind of R bind, um, row bind uh, operation. And we have label and prediction. So essentially, it would be column store. I'm not sure if it shows in the footnote, but uh, let me just uh, quickly do a check. 
yes, it's, it's there. Good. Uh, and we do this uh, for each iteration, and we display it. So whenever you see for each or map, uh, this is how the function. And Python understands uh, uh, functional programming. It's one of those idioms that make it extremely versatile and uh, useful tools for uh, processing. So there is a question. Earlier you mentioned uh, MLib and ML. It seems like uh, this slide is about MLib. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, ML utils a good indicator, and that's training classifier. That's another one. Everything else is uh, the same thing. But again, don't be, I would say, discouraged that there are two packages that you need to, to learn. Essentially, uh, the matter of transpiling, or uh, there are a lot of examples, and you can just compare them side by side and see what um, what the difference are. Um, very minimal. So that's what's uh, going to be the result of this operation. Right? We do prediction for our test data. Um, so on the left, we will have um, class labels from the test file. It's just one of those uh, things that you would use Python for. Python is very good for kind of uh, chunking and uh, slicing data. Um, So we've got pretty much 100% of, uh, of of the heat. It's just, again, it might not be very conclusive. It's just a smoke and mirror. But the, essentially, when you build this matrix, it's possible to have something like, um, we've got two class classification, right? Uh, something might happen like this. Uh, a test file also contains. So this is what the truth, right? That's true, meaning that it's kind of a common, common belief. That's what we have. But on the right column, we've got predictions. So it might be something like one here and zero here. And there are some statistics which would tell you what is the error, what's the percentage of errors of uh, false positives or kind of uh, negative negatives type of thing. So in our case, everything to be kind of honky dory. We've got everything properly identified. We are happy. And uh, if you have like uh, three classes, that would be probably like two, right? And we would be going through the uh, same operation, uh, but it would be for every, every row. Probably it's not going to be a, a very good um, for large data sets. But you can at least do some aggregation saying, uh, what is the percentage of our errors? Uh, what is the, uh, the factor, the error rate? I mentioned that you can serialize the model. You can save it. And for that matter, you can um, kind of process it in a distributed manner, if you will. So we've got five trees, and that's what you would see uh, if you do this model to debug string. Uh, you will have, uh, again, let me just help you understand what, what it actually is talking to you. We've got five trees, right? Every tree is a decision. Uh, it contains uh, rules, those um, decision points which uh, tell you what uh, heuristics, um, I insights, the algorithm is using in order to do the classification. We've got uh, feature zero, and uh, we've got, we might have multiple features, but it looks like the most informative feature was identified to be the first one. You might have uh, 10, uh, hundreds and more of features, but it looks like that's uh, how kind of a system uh, was loaded. Uh, everything is done by feature zero. So if the feature is below nine, then predict that it, that particular object observation was classified as belonging to the zero um, class. Otherwise, if it's more than nine, it's one. Of course, if you've got uh, features which uh, the system is not very conclusive about, there might be multiple built-in, like if, else, if, else, then, uh, something like that. Um, and by the way, if you have a very long 
a list of those things, kind of a runaway type of uh, uh, decision tree. It's a good indication that you are, you've got a problem of overfitting. So overfitting is really, uh, it's kind of a, a little bit of a nightmare where essentially you are chasing the noise in data rather than getting a good um, approximation. The beauty of um, the random forest is that it really, one of the positive side effects, it's not only that it's fast, but it's kind of a, uh, kind of a collective quorum based. We've got five trees voting. Essentially, if you've got the majority of uh, trees voting that this guy belongs to that class, uh, the majority would uh, carry that vote. Um, but it also deals with overfitting. It's a very simple algorithm, very fast at runtime. It might take kind of a substantial time to train, but you can do it offline. But the testing, predicting the data, happens extremely fast. Essentially, it's just assembly code, if else. Just uh, several machine instructions, and you have prediction. So that's how it works. Uh, you see, in, in other case, like 3, 4, also identified like feature as being a good uh, point of split, but it found that boundary to be 13 rather than 9. Okay. So it looks like it gave it a little bit of a slack uh, because every uh, tree traverses just part of the data set, not the whole thing. You partition it, you speed up processing, and when you do this thing, that overfitting, it just somehow is being dealt with transparently. It's one of those very nice, soft things that all of a sudden, gosh, I, I got uh, uh, another benefit of this algorithm. Okay. So that's what uh, I wanted to say about um, Random Forest. Uh, moving on. Uh, clustering, uh, again, MLib. That's what we're talking about. K-means is one of the most uh, important. In many cases, uh, it it's kind of a, takes time. It's a lengthy process during the training. Actually, there's no training as such. The system just goes figure out. But when you arrive at that position, you know, the centroids of the clusters, so the points of gravity in that, uh, in that universe of your data points, then um, you can start applying classification. If you, it's okay with you, it sits well with your, uh, like your business uh, kind of flair, uh, and uh, it makes sense generally, like for subject matter experts, that this data is really what uh, we expect. We know the number of k-means. Uh, so let's say uh, we've got that uh, example. We've got points uh, just. Uh, for a second, disregard uh, colors, if you can see those colors on my slide, and those uh, kind of uh, hair sites. Just think about this, just scatter plot. Uh, just for your visualization aid, uh, things have been clarified, and you've got that center um, of gravity already pre-built for you. So essentially the data set that uh, was used in that demo uh, already knew uh, what the centroids are. But let's see how the system figures out. So there's the algorithms, uh, the algorithm that how it works, what, what it does. Uh, we have, again, Spark context. We create number of centroids. We need to know this. That's the only thing that uh, K-means needs to know, how many clusters. Uh, we could have provided like two. And the system would position if there were two clusters that we suspected. System would kind of try to merge that red with that black one next adjacent ones. It would position the centroid a little bit below. And in some cases, you might say, okay, it's just good enough. Uh, we can get by this. But uh, in more specific uh, situations, you need to really, you need to play around. That's your kind of your knob. You can say four, three, two, and see how system behaves. A little bit of a kind of a scientific approach. We load the file and we start processing it. Again, we're using NumPy. Whenever you see NP, it's just a way to speed up things. Uh, we do list uh, apprehension, uh, comprehension, uh, and that's what uh, we essentially do, k-means. That's uh, actually object which represents this algorithm. We do training. We take the data, 
in its entirety, we specify KS3. We have 10 concurrent runs and epsilon. It's uh, a point. Uh, essentially, it's a, it's a measure for letting the algorithm to converge so that the fluctuation of that uh, uh, centroid is not going to be more than, in our case, um, 1,000 over feature value. And we compute the cost. Uh, cost is how how well our model be, uh, performs. Um, and we can do save. Yeah, another example. You can serialize it. You can save it uh, like through a socket connection somewhere across the globe, right? And people could use it there. You can test it, I don't know, in an offshore company and then send it to, to, to another place. So we've got that model. Uh, KMIS model allows you to uh, actually to load the model. And then you can do predict. So what we are predicting here, we load the actual values for features. We've got two features, right? Feature A, feature B, essentially class A, uh, we, and we've got uh, three classes, 0, 1, 2, or 1, 0, 1, 2. And we want to predict that point. And in our case, uh, the system would identify that uh, it belongs to this cluster. If we had something like, I don't know, 10 and 12, for feature sets, it would be uh, clusterized as belonging to this cluster. So now, instead of a clustering algorithm, you essentially perform a classification uh, operation, which is very fast, which does pretty much what uh, the boundary comparison of that uh, random forest does for you. Okay, uh, if you compare this API, uh, not, not the whole thing, and the whole, the whole application, but some of the key points, in ML, it would look something like this. We've got k-means as a function. We set number of uh, clusters to set seed. Uh, it's just a way to enable uh, your algorithm to be reproducible. So this will reproduce the same result over and over again. Because the point is that k-means uses random selection of points uh, on, on a data set. Uh, and uh, you might not converge to the same exactly the same data points uh, of centroids. And you do fit instead of train, okay? So so what? Not, not a big deal. As long as you know the language, uh, you know what you're doing, uh, help will get you uh, up and running. Okay, so what we are doing now, we are trying to identify the, uh, okay, so there's a question. Uh, what if uh, it was seven and seven? Uh, so the point is kind of to uh, uh, trick the system. So we've got seven and seven, right? Um, the system might misqualify, uh, mis uh, uh, classify it. So the point is, uh, which color should I use? Blue. Okay. It's a good experiment. Okay. So we've got this kind of a feature set. We've got seven, and we've got seven, right? Well, if we do this kind of EDA, uh, exploratory data analysis using visual, probably it will tell us, you know, what it looks like this guy really is very close to here. Uh, and probably that's what's going to happen. But at the same time, uh, the point is absolutely on the money. Uh, what happens if this guy has a very big dispersion, right, very big uh, standard deviation? We've got all those kind of points intermixing. At this point in time, if we don't do uh, support vector machine or any other kind of a kernel tricks, uh, probably the system might enlist this point as belonging to this guy. So it's possible. It's kind of boundary cases. But for that, if you have this kind of a situation where you have lots of overlapping data because of that very big spread or um, either through big uh, standard deviation, your sensors kind of are not picking up the right signals. They have lots of noise. Uh, but at the same time, um, you understand that logically uh, you should have different kind of layers. Just one layer sits on top of the other. And if you look at it from that, that coordinate, you know what I'm talking about, that, that uh, um, kind of a staking, uh, that, that axis uh, staking, you essentially can separate uh, those layers into distinct slices of your data 
it's a kernel tri uh, trick, uh, that's what it's called, and then you can use it to just see a very clear picture, okay, uh, but uh, k-means not going to help you with that. k-means, it's uh, pretty kind of a does the job slowly, surely, but uh, in some cases like this, um, it might not work as you would expect. Okay, so hopefully, uh, at least um, uh, you've got options. SVM are supported, uh, you can do that as well. Okay. Um, a little bit more elegant, I would say. Whenever I see this kind of a dot, 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 it's, uh, it's fluid API, and uh, instead of kind of a squishing everything in just one, one thing, which is not a big deal at all, as long as you know what you're doing, this type of thing might be a little bit more appealing to uh, uh, to some to some folks. So when you do print of centroids, uh, you will see something like this. So these are the actual uh, coordinates in feature in the feature set uh, space. What it should be? Uh, they were supposed to be. By the way, those guys were generated uh, with a mean of ten mean of five, mean of two, and standard deviation of some sort, with larger deviation uh, in that uh, last uh, centroid. So your system, by the way, the indexing, it's not kind of a, the biggest would be on top. Uh, system would randomly select the rows, and you need to understand what's actually happening. So that, the very first one has some offset because of that standard deviation. So you've got two point something. Uh, instead of 10 and 10, we've got 9.5 and 10, 5 again. It's not exact, not exact science, but uh, it's, it answers the task, answers the, the questions that we, the, we might ask. So what if I have this kind of a 7 and 7 or 6 and 6? The system will at least be able to classify it. And in some cases, when you have no idea what that clusterization was all about, you just had some vague concept that there should be some partitioning like gender wise or maybe uh, geography wise something that has you have this kind of a nagging feeling which kind of uh, drives your uh, thought process um, but now the system would probably just confirm your assumptions it would be kind of a yahoo uh, moment mm, not exact but it's accurate enough giving you enough uh, space uh, for, for for maneuver um, okay, uh, comparing um, lib and ML, uh, so Spark 2.0 uh, was put on kind of ice. It's kind of, a, they call it a maintenance mode, but if you really uh, trans translate it into plain English, it's kind of a freeze. It's not deprecated, guys, don't be scared, use it, but um, freezing means no more additions. They would be maintaining if there are bugs, but it's not going to do you much. But uh, the force is there to really move it towards ML. By the way, eventually, maybe with version 3, maybe in 2 or 3 years, that guy would be gone. Okay, so that's the whole story. So, uh, machine learning pipeline, available only in that new um, ML package uh, where the data frame became the centerpiece of um, that processing unit which contains data. And now you can build uh, pipelines, processing uh, flows uh, from data in kind of inception, elaboration, construction, and whatever they kind of might call it. So, uh, for example, if you process uh, texts uh, to extract maybe sentiments, uh, classify document, uh, uh, what you would usually do, you would tokenize each document uh, in the bag of words. Uh, um, there would be some conversion, probably it will use some sort of uh, 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 hashing tricks, um, kind of a number of techniques to help you with data processing, building vocabularies and what's not. And then uh, you would be doing prediction. So all those things can be combined in just one flow. You, you'll have just one application right, instead of three potential, uh, which would be working in concept, and the whole thing would be orchestrated uh, to follow the logic, reusing, uh, and it would be, there would be no handoffs, there would be no kind of a 
stop uh, switch context execute. It will be just continuous flow. And remember that execute a process where you have tasks. That's kind of a big, uh, kind of a big picture. Uh, essentially, those tasks would be executed within the same executor, meaning that it will be multi-pass machine learning processing doing a good job by um, just coalescing the whole thing into a single unit of work. Okay, so that's uh, that's kind of where things are moving. And again, scikit-learn was the major influence. Uh, so the question is, data frame-based API based on Pandas? No, 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 it's uh, totally different. It's uh, machine learning. Uh, Pandas, uh, it's, it's um, um, Python-specific, right? This guy, even though they use Python, they only use NumPy. I'm not sure if Pandas uh, could be used because Pandas essentially kind of data frame like API. Uh, my guess is that they just borrow NumPy. I haven't seen uh, any imports uh, for Pandas. Even though you can probably do certain things, but uh, uh, they fall back on the data frame provided by uh, machine learning itself. So main concepts, uh, you've got uh, data frame, uh, you've got a transformer. Uh, it's a little bit of, um, I would say, confusing piece uh, as to what that transformer is actually does. Uh, so transformer can be a feature transformer when you essentially shuffle uh, things vertically, right? You've got, you can drop certain things, you can apply dimensionality reduction, you can do uh, kind of interesting things, but you're transforming the data feature-wise. Like if you think about columns, you kind of do something with columns. You drop in columns, add in columns, create uh, synthetic columns. And uh, transformer is also used to train, uh, to use the train model to perform predictions, right? Essentially, what happens is uh, it's kind of a, usually add uh, a column uh, which becomes kind of a predicted label. So that's where uh, they want to use it, kind of a transform to produce a prediction. So estimator, by the way, is a borrow this terminology, I believe, from scikit-learn. They've got the estimator. So it's machine learning algorithm, which uh, um, can be trained on a data frame, uh, fit, it's kind of a training, uh, produce a transformer. So that transformer can uh, essentially do the prediction. And pipeline combines everything to, to, to make it uh, flow nicely, and that's what it looks like. We've got two distinct passes. Again, let me highlight. I should use. I always have this problem of choosing a color. Okay, green. Green should be okay. So we've got the training time, the training phase, and the prediction time. Okay, so that two different things. This is uh, kind of a boundary. They're not in parallel. That two. Kind of there should be some uh, kind of a break between those. So what we do, uh, we have this flow of, uh, let's say, uh, we have a raw text, we ingest the data, we extract uh, features, and we generate the model. That's our final target. So what we do, we invoke this pipeline. Um, I guess it's not helpful. Um, pipeline estimator. That's how we build that logistic regression. So tokenizer is a transformation that takes that raw text, transforms into words. Then we would like to minimize that bag of words, which potentially might be, I don't know, like millions uh, of those tokens with specialized terminology, dates, uh, some system names. We perform a hashing of the term uh, factors Again, and we produce a model logistic regression to perform uh, text um, classification. So that model is available. Now we do a prediction. We get the data, which is uh, our test data. We perform tokenization. We go through the same thing, but now our logistic regression model kicks in and it transforms our feature vector into something that we can already uh, use as a prediction. So we'll have that label column saying that it's do document of this type or document of that type. Okay, so that's kind of two things. That's what how pipeline works. Uh, you might not see benefits of it, but I, I guess eventually when you start commoditizing machine learning in your organization, you will see that uh, it's what, what, you, uh, really, uh, what you really need. Okay. 
Uh, we've covered a great deal of uh, the ground. I understand that um, we could barely, I don't know, like scratch the surface. Um, that would be the time for me to take any questions that you might have. So uh, just put your question in the questions uh, pane. Uh, when I see it, I will read it back and I'll try to answer it. Okay, it looks like we are good. Uh, I don't see any questions. Uh, looks like maybe you are totally confused. But at the same time, I hope, okay, we got some questions coming through. Um, so the basic question, where do R fits in this? Uh, I missed a couple of minutes in the book table um, content. What is, okay, that's another question. So R, um, Spark supports R. It does, uh, but it probably does it in a scaled down version. It it only supported in the um, Spark standalone deployment. Uh, Spark alongside Hadoop deployment, which you can get out of uh, um, CDH or HDP or MAPR distributions. Uh, they have binaries for R, some examples, uh, but it's not integrated. A huge effort, I believe, is required to, to, to make it work. So R uh, is not fitting very well. That's my answer. But at the same time, I am not saying that R should be discarded. Uh, as I was trying to make a point of uh, use R alongside with Python, alongside with Spark. So that would be uh, probably your recipe for success. Another question is, um, uh, contents that have been shown in the first uh, couple of minutes. Is it a book's table of contents? Yes, there is a book uh, table of contents at the beginning. That's right, uh, Oliver. I believe there should be a link for the document uh, that you can uh, um, use and download the PDF file. Let me just, uh, I believe I should get it somewhere. Okay, so another question, how uh, how to label the features? Uh, say instead of feature zero, I want to call it a meter reading. There should be a lookup table. So for example, if you would like to map that meter reading to zero, uh, there should be uh, some sort of, um, I don't know how you, how you call it, like a napkin-like uh, lookup. Uh, you can build it in code, uh, so that in code, uh, in terms of Java doc or whatever doc string you're using, uh, it would just give you that uh, that thing. And I'm going to paste, I've got this link um, in the chat window. Okay, so uh, use that link. Chat window, okay. Um, any more questions? Uh, so the question of uh, what if high performance is needed at the training uh, stage of model? What would be the best approach, Python or Scala or other? Uh, you know what, don't discard Python. I would start with Python. And if you feel that all of us, you probably don't need to start training on the whole, I don't know, like, uh, like, nine petabytes worth of data. Probably you need to do sampling. And usually I would suspect you would have data in the region of gigabytes, not, not more. That's probably, uh, maybe it would be more realistically tens of megabytes. So when you have this thing, uh, try Python out. And if you feel, do a sample, kind of do uh, maybe 10% of it. Just you've got 10 megabytes, uh, try at least maybe just one megabyte, see how it goes. It's not linear, but at least it will give you a sense of how Python would uh, tackle this task, how efficient. And if you see that it just goes forever, just shut it down, and the, and the only option other that you have is Scala. 
slash Java. I would go for, with Scala. Uh, Scala will give you all the benefits of Java as, as also with an added benefit of being a, a fully functional programming language, uh, very nice to use, except for some advanced topics. So that would be the way to go. Uh, Python generally is uh, a very good candidate for doing uh, machine learning on Spark. Very good because you don't need to compile, forget about that Maven repository and scripts and all that kind of a stuff and uh, sometimes uh, problems with those jar files. Python is good. Okay, so uh, that's good. So what else? Um, that's all I wanted to say, guys. Thank you very much uh, for attending, for asking questions. Uh, I'm rounding up, um, shutting down this session. I uh, wish you every success. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.